These early Netherlands were particularly initiative to build coalitions of game changers that can solve supply-side bottlenecks to get new, high-quality plant-based products to consumers faster. They see potential for localized protein production chains to improve quality and availability, in addition to tapping into existing animal protein and cross-crop knowledge. We will begin with a presentation from Jerome and then move into questions from myself and Sophia, the co-president at the Chapel Hill All Protein Project. Thank you so much for joining us, Jerome, and you can take it away. Thank you, Hannah and Sophia, also for letting me share my thoughts on how to accelerate the protein transition during this great event. Um, and um, let me start with this image of a light bulb. And um, the reason that I'm showing this to you is that uh, there are great similarities between the energy transition and the protein transition. Uh, to start off with, the, the energy transition, one of the, of the tipping points was that the, uh, the old, good old glowing bulb, uh, as you see here, was banned back in 2009. And um, one of the reasons, the main reasons that it was banned was because that over 75% of the energy that was fed to the glowing bulb was not converted to light, but was converted to heat. So in effect, 75% of the energy was lost. And um, everybody understood that that was a real crazy thing and that we cannot afford an energy loss of 75%. And um, having said that, um, also the loss of energy and also nitrogen involved when producing, for example, beef or cheese is also lost during the way from heating it to the soil to at the end of our plate. And it all starts with also that, um, apologies for that. It also started with uh, realizing that this crazy energy loss is something we simply cannot afford as humanity and also towards a more sustainable pl uh, planet and future. And um, another thing that is uh, relevant in this, um, in this respect is that um, when it comes to also saving energy and also to using energy well, also overconsumption of energy, also in the forms of the consumption of proteins, is becoming more and more uh, apparent and urgent. So the re reduction of overconsumption of protein is a big challenge for us all. And uh, in that respect, uh, to give you an idea, in Europe, the overconsumption, the general overconsumption is about 70% uh, with respect to the general guidelines. And in, in the US, it's even 80%. So um, since the, the, the production of especially animal proteins consumes so much energy, um, it is a very dangerous cocktail or combination combined also with the fact that we overconsume our proteins. And um, well, I have to say that um, especially in the, in the current very hectic and dynamic also geopolitical situation, it's becoming more and more apparent that the combination of protein or energy overconsumption uh, and also the balance that has been disturbed, the balance in our consumption of animal proteins and plant proteins, um, that, that we do really need to enter a new age of proteins an age which in fact is not so much different as we have experienced it only two generations ago, where for example in the Netherlands, uh, the majority of the proteins that we consumed were uh, produced locally in the Netherlands and were also of a plant-based origin. And um, I think um, with everything that's happening around us, we already see that protein feed, as it says here, 
for feed, but especially also for food, um, uh, will be tied. It says here it could be tied, but, but I'm convinced that it will be tied. And in that respect, we have to really act soon to become more protein self-sufficient. Well, now, and that's um, that's more easily said than done. Um, just saying to everybody, uh, start eating, consuming less proteins, um, restore the protein balance, eat more plant proteins, more legumes, more nuts, um, more mushrooms. And uh, um, that's, well, um, that's quite a challenge for, for many of us. And I've also personally experienced um, being grown up with uh, an abundancy of meat and dairy that it is quite a challenge to cut down on meat and dairy consumption and to start increasing also the amount of plant-based proteins in my diet. And um, I started wondering about 15 years ago, what would be the, the ultimate way to use my personal experience and also my, my education and to provide a solution to restore that protein balance. And um, I'm a chemical technologist by origin, and I'm specialized in uh, developing extraction technologies and also technologies to texturize plant proteins, um, delivering textures that mimic fish or meat or even dairy and cheese, for example. Um, and I started uh, to think, okay, how can I use that uh, that talent and experience also to produce and develop products that could help people in restoring that protein balance. And um, here you see a, a, a picture of my hands actually uh, holding a piece of plant meat. This is 100% plant-based. Um, that we co-developed, that we developed back in 2009 using a, a new, at that time, quite an, an exciting technology, uh, shear or extrusion based, where we managed to, um, to transform plant proteins from all kinds of legumes to meat-like textures. And I myself and also my family um, were really excited about the taste the smell, the ease of preparation. And, and that also um, shed a new light for me on how we could contribute to restoring that protein balance. And I decided back then that, um, that I really need to start a new company, also upscaling the technology. And uh, coincidence or not, this was back in 2009, the year that I also was in touch with Ethan Brown, the uh, CEO of Beyond Meat, whom you may know. And um, well, basically, because we used similar technologies, um, we were really excited that Beyond Meat was exploring the market in, on, on, um, in, in the Americas, whereas we uh, started doing so in, uh, in Europe because the, we had a, a shared vision and also a shared belief that meat-like products could be real transitional products, as I call them, and using new technologies to create the products to, um, to make it more easy to, uh, to eat more plant-based again. And um, uh, at that time, I also uh, found that, it's, um, um, that it can be a strength to seek uh, partnerships instead of polarization compared with existing uh, protein production technologies and also processing technologies. And I'm, I'm quite sure that when I would ask you what you think about first when, when thinking about uh, and associating with the Netherlands, I'm quite sure there will be a mill involved and, uh, and also some grassland and some, some happy cows playing around. And, um, and I think that this is also one of the strengths of the Netherlands. We are uh, renowned for the fact that we um, produce and process a lot of meat and dairy. And to be honest, that's nothing more or less as 
producing and processing and distributing proteins. And um, um, I started also wondering um, how can we use the technologies that have been, have been developed over the past centuries um, in the meat and dairy industry and that have, that have led to the fact that currently uh, every day over a million uh, uh, consumers worldwide um, have meat from the Netherlands on their plate or dairy. Um, on the one hand, I'm, I'm quite proud, but on the other hand, I do see that that's, that's not a future-proof model. I think it's more worth the while to use the experience and the technologies and the infrastructure to export our technology, our, uh, our creativity, rather than the meat and dairy itself. Um, and of course, it can be uh, meat-like products or dairy-like products or even fish-like products. Um, and talking about, um, about that, um, we, we have not stood still here over the past 20 years. And um, there are fortunately quite some um, uh, front runners um, also within the dairy and, and meat industry that have now redefine the technologies and come up with new technologies to produce proteins locally and to become also more protein self-sufficient. Um, up to the, um, the level that the Netherlands is now considered as a plant protein powerhouse. And that's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's uh, quite impressive that in this very tiny country, that we, that we are here with only 17 million inhabitants, we already have over uh, 250 companies that are working in the area of protein seal, all developing new business models, new technologies and new solutions, enabling all of us, not just in the Netherlands, but worldwide to restore the protein balance. And, um, and also um, to the point that, um, New, um, new employment is created. So we see that uh, the number of farmers producing meat and dairy is decreasing and that new ways of producing food in general and protein food in specifically is, is rapidly growing. So we see a growing um, number of companies also um, uh, setting their production facilities here in the Netherlands as a European hub, companies like Oatly or Beyond Meat. So um, a serious business as um, the protein transition is now rapidly also becoming serious business. And um, I'm an entrepreneur uh, myself, so I know that if there's no business model, if there's no vision or there are no, there's no forecast for, for creating sound business models. Um, it is bound to, uh, to, to, have an only, to, to have a short life. And, um, and that is really rapidly also changing the market and also the belief, uh, not just uh, at entrepreneurs and companies that have their history in meat and dairy, but also um, governmental bodies. So the, the Dutch government is now also starting to really see how the protein shift and how new technologies in producing and uh, uh, processing proteins can deliver new business models, building upon the fundament of the insights and industry that we have created here over the past century in the dairy and the meat domain. Um, and um, in, in order to uh, to make that more visible and tangible, we, um, we uh, created an online magazine called Future Protein NL, Future Protein Netherlands. And in that we have um, specifically paid attention to young people um, creating and also scaling up new technologies for producing proteins in a more sustainable way. For example, you see here a Corian van der Berg from Fumi Ingredients um, and uh, Birgit Decker from uh, Rival Foods also creating new textures that could even really mimic uh, 
that of beef, for example. And um, another reason why um, these young people uh, get so well connected in the ecosystem and get the opportunity to scale up new technologies is that we have created here an ecosystem that currently includes over 120 of those 250 companies to join and to combine the, uh, the knowledge, the infrastructure and the creativity. So really working together towards the, the bigger goal um, and um, um, while well, really connecting generations. And uh, talking about that, um, um, this is uh, a, a man uh, on the left side, as well as on the right side, by the way. His name is Jaap Korteweg. And I'm, um, I'm showing his picture here because back in 2009, he approached me uh, when I started my company creating these meat-like um, textures. And he said, I, Jeroen, I have an idea. And this idea is to become the largest butcher in the world. And I said, okay, that's an interesting idea. And how do you want to do that? I, and he said, I'm going to do that via um, a new brand called the Vegetarian Butcher. And that made it even more uh, fascinating to me. Uh, and I said, okay, is that a, 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 a butcher um, selling meat and being a vegetarian himself, or and he said no, it's 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 a butcher, but only selling plant-based meat. And um, and what I learned from that is because he he became one of my lunching customers. So he bought uh, plant chicken uh, pieces and and pork fillets. Um, what I learned from that is that. Um, a new technology, in this case, for creating meat and, and uh, fish-like textures, by itself is not a, a recipe for success. You really need game changers that have, the, that have the vision and the opportunity to reach out to specific uh, groups of consumers. And um, well, we both were quite successful, and also his brand was acquired by, uh, by Unilever, and now he set up a new company called Those Vegan Cowboys, also with the next challenge to create a real hard cheese uh, based on um, based on plant proteins. And um, that's, I think, also one of the reasons that um, that here in the Netherlands, in, in, in co-creating new solutions. Um, we have been uh, successful every once in a while. Um, now then, moving on, I think um, uh, when associating about the, the Netherlands, uh, also this may a picture, or, or let's say at least the, um, uh, the connection with agriculture is also coming up. And, and in fact, this is a picture that was taken two years ago uh, when uh, farmers from the Netherlands uh, protested um, against the uh, rigid plans of the Dutch government on how to uh, solve the nitrogen problem that we have here. Um, the, ne the Netherlands is a nitrogen hotspot, um, partly because it's, it's a dense and urbanized nation, and also because we have a very concentrated livestock operation. And um, well, when talking about proteins, you're by definition also talking about nitrogen, about 16% of, of protein is nitrogen. So it is very directly also related to the uh, agricultural situation. And um, um, even though the, the, the protest was quite rigid, it is still uh, in, in this year, 2022, believed more than ever than that the feedstock level should go down and that um, also the emission of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, also nitrogen based and also the use of nitrogen um, as fertilizers really needs to be cut down even by half in, in 2030. And um, well, also that is more easily said than done and to, to to create solutions for that, we need game changes and we need new technologies. 
And um, talking about, about game changes, this is a picture of, uh, of me with my son Lex, my daughter Eline, my wife Sandra, and on the outside you see Bart and Tom. And Bart and Tom are fourth generation farmers here in the Netherlands. And um, they have said to themselves and also to their parents and their surroundings, we are going to farm different. We will use the nitrogen out of the air to be fixed in uh, pulses, uh, fava say crops like soy or lupin or fava. Um, and uh, well, let's start by, by using that soy um, or that crops uh, as feed for our cows, which you see here on the right, um, uh, but also for direct human consumption. So I really like this image, not because only it, it really connects the generations and also Bart and Tom being there, but also because in one picture you see how uh, the reality of uh, cattle and livestock can be united with the produ production uh, of, in this case, soy, which you see here growing on the left. Um, but as you can imagine, Bart and Tom, uh, being farmers, they really need the support also in, um, in getting new technologies available to convert the soy to tasty and healthy products, in this case, dairy uh, similar products. So they have named their company the New Milkman. And they say uh, they are going to create a new Milky Way uh, towards a more sustainable future. And um, this is one of the ways that we can also look at a more sustainable protein future, and which is very much embraced, as you can imagine, in the Netherlands. Um, so we even have a national protein strategy, also stimulating the growing, but especially also the processing and consumption of Dutch grown proteins, such as lupin, soy, or fava. Um, there may be another association that you may have with the Netherlands. Um, and um, there is this company called the Dutch Wheat Burger, who has developed a um, a whole line of products under the brand called the Dutch Wheat Burger. Uh, and one of the essential uh, ingredients um, in this, uh, in, in their products um, is wheat, um, seaweed to be more explicit. And um, um, they, have, um, they have really used the association of the Netherlands with, uh, with wheat in a multiple way. Uh, but in this case, they've also used the association that um, the Netherlands is also uh, well uh, surrounded by by an aqueous environment, and uh, we are very much a, a sea or water loving company com uh, uh, country. And um, what what we see is that another solution um, to to make the more plant based life more easy for for many consumers is also to use aquatic proteins. And seaweed is one of them. Um, but we're even now also uh, growing water lentils or duckweed, as they're also called, because they're also pumped with, full with, with proteins, but it's, and, and algae. Um, and there also technology really comes in. Uh, seaweed and, and, and water lentils you can, you can produce in open ponds. You can also produce algae in open ponds, but it is more efficient for, for many reasons to produce algae in, uh, in a um, heterotrophic way, which means that you don't use light as a, an energy source, but sugar. And you can do the production of algae in, in vessels, basically um, fermentation vessels that are very much similar also to how you well, I'll come later, I'll come back to that later. But anyways, um, uh, we have uh, quite some companies that are now also developing uh, colorless, um, very high functional algae um, at a very large scale 
using, in fact, again, also technologies that are quite familiar from an historic, historic perspective. Um, and that's what I wanted to, uh, to show here. Um, well, the Netherlands is also number three uh, when it comes to the export of beer worldwide. And um, just as beer is produced in, in big vessels, you can also brew proteins. And um, that is a very fascinating new technology domain that is being explored and, and discovered over the past five years in the Netherlands, but also worldwide. There are quite some companies that are now starting to brew proteins in these vessels, uh, microproteins or precision uh, um, type of proteins with specific functionalities. And worldwide, it is expected that the uh, microbial fermentation technology market um, will uh, reach over $2.5 billion by 2027, um, growing 6% uh, annually. And you now see over, well, over 30 companies worldwide really diving into that. And quite a few of them are also located or associated with the Netherlands. And this is one of them. They, they are called um, the Protein Brewery. And uh, what they use is also yeast and also um, uh, energetic waste streams for other, from other industries to produce microproteins. And you, you may know a, a brand called corn. I'm not sure if it's, it's familiar in, um, in America, uh, originating from, uh, from the UK. And basically, that's one of the first microproteins that was on the market since uh, 1985 already. Um, so this also, growing, brewing proteins is one way of supplying new technology solutions for becoming more protein self-sufficient. Um, and these solutions, uh, when it comes to growing and processing pulses or growing, uh, processing uh, algae or microproteins, that is something of the here and, and now. But we also can imagine uh, in the future that there could be a real alternative for the Haber-Bosch process. And um, for those who are not familiar with that, the, the Haber-Bosch process, process is a technique that directly synthesizes ammonia um, by capturing naturally abundant nitrogen in the atmosphere and reacting it with hydrogen. Um, but for doing that, and, and the nitrogen, sorry, the, um, the ammonia can be used also as a fertilizer, and it's, um, it was, uh, was developed over 100 years ago, and it's, it, it's really been a game changer uh, when it comes to increasing the yields, but also increasing the nitrogen challenge that we, uh, that we have, and it's becoming more and more apparent. Um, and it's also costing a lot of energy. Uh, the process um, is operated at very high temperatures, uh, up to 500 degrees centigrade, and very high pressures, up to 20 megapascal. Um, and that has made that basically the Haber process, the Haber Boss process, is the most energy intensive um, commuted, uh, commodity chemical responsible for one to, to even 2% of the global energy consumption. And, uh, and approximately 1.4% of the total CO2 emissions worldwide. So if we can find an alternative for the Haber Bosch process to produce ammonia or to produce nitrogen that can be absorbed and used also in the, uh, in the agro industry, that would be a real game changer. And uh, well, that, there are quite some uh, scientists uh, working worldwide on, uh, on, on solving that. And, and one of them, is in fact uh, a spin-off from a Dutch university and the company is called Vital Fluid and it is um, one of the first uh, companies that are really operating at an industrial level and providing and really capturing plasma and to convert it to, um, into aqueous solutions, nitrogen ammonia rich that can be applied also for the agriculture. Um, so that is really an exciting uh, development also when it comes to solutions in, um, in creating more, um, more sustainable um, uh, protein balance. Um, well, um, 
I hope that uh, with the examples that I gave, I gave you uh, some insight on um, my personal vision. Um, we really need to become more protein self-sufficient. We cannot afford the dangerous combination of protein overconsumption uh, in general, but also the overconsumption of animal proteins. Um, we cannot afford the energy loss of up to 75% along the way uh, from ground to mouth, basically. Uh, but we have solutions, and technology plays a very important role in that. And the technology can be um, existing technologies um, that we are using from the brewery industry and also from the more conventional plant, uh, animal, and dairy industry. But it can also be radically new in this uh, technologies like capturing a natural plasma and converting it to ammonia. Um, uh, and last but not least, not least um, I truly believe also in connecting generations. So with that, I would like to, to conclude my presentation and I hope to have inspired you and I also invite you to make the connection. If you want with me personally, I would happy to provide you more information and also happily to connect with you. So um, really enjoy the, uh, the remaining program of your uh, very interesting summit. And thank you also, Hannah, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. Great, thank you so much, Jerome. That was so interesting to hear about all the innovation behind um, the all protein field in the Netherlands. Um, so now we're gonna transition to more of a Q&A style portion um, where Sophia and I can ask questions for you, Drone. Um, so first, I guess we'll start off. Um, you talked obviously a lot about the, the protein transition in the Netherlands and everything you guys are doing to make this transition, but how do we replicate um, this Netherlands all protein ecosystem in other places in the world, such as in North Carolina? Well, uh, that's a very interesting question because um, Critical mass at the right, creating critical mass at the right time with the right people is a, is also a, a critical condition to be successful in the future. And over the years, I've created quite some alliances and communities and clusters. And what I've learned from that, Hannah, is that uh, it, it all starts with creating um, a a common denominator that is accepted and realized by uh, by a group. Uh, that also sees that if a certain ambition is realized, that they can all benefit. And not just in terms of um, sustainability KPIs, but also in terms of commercial KPIs. And um, it has really helped me to, uh, for example, quantify the, and also the, the communities that I, that I created to really quantify the benefits of joining forces, not just in terms of sustainability, for example, capturing nitrogen or um, reducing wa uh, water or land use, um, but also in commercial in a commercial perspective, and um, uh, and that has really stimulated um, well game changes to really do things differently in terms uh, of their conventional business that they were used to, but also in terms of collaboration. Um, so for example, my collaboration with this Jaap Porto, the vegetarian butcher was exempl exemplary uh, because um, at the time there were quite some people also uh, telling me that with this new technology that we developed, we should really create our own brand. And I, I somehow felt that, um, that there would be people better um, suited to uh, really reach out to and communicate to specific target groups, which wasn't me, which was in this case, this Jaap Porterweg. And so really stepping out of, of the idea that um, we, we needed to do it all ourselves. So not just upscaling the technology, but also creating a brand and doing the marketing around it. But let's, but said, okay, let's, let's step away from that model and let's do it together. That is, has really set an example and, 
and we translated it also to the community. So within this community of 120 companies called the Protein Community, um, one of the key pillars is that we have this common denominator. We all want to restore the protein balance. Um, but another pillar is that we, we have said, okay, the basics are the basis uh, um, is that we use each other's experience, infrastructure, and also complementarity um, uh, um, to really accelerate and to shorten the time to market of new uh, of all protein innovations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, um, Sophia. Do you have a question? Yeah, so something that really resonated with me earlier is when you said that we need to really focus on partnership over polarization between alt protein and the conventional animal meat industry. And I thought it was really cool to see the dairy farm partially converting over to be a um, alt milk farm. And so, um, but the, you mentioned how there's a lot of um, there's a lack of opportunity for a lot of these farmers to get the technologies needed to become alt protein producers. And so I'm wondering what sort of incentives or support programs governments or organizations like Food Valley can provide these farmers to help transition to become alt protein producers. Yeah, yeah. Um, also a very interesting question because um, also, that is not easy. If, if you are a fourth, fifth, sixth generation farmer and uh, you yourself and your parents and your grandparents have, in, and have invested all their lives and all their money in creating an infrastructure to produce meat and dairy, um, it is not so easy to, to transition to, uh, to other uh, protein sources. And... Um, and um, what we see here now is that uh, on the one hand, there are also new coalitions of, as we call them, protein farmers taking shape. Um, and these are individual farmers who have said, okay, let's start working with soy or lupin or faba or pea or, or quinoa uh, and, or other protein crops. Um, and let's start thinking about how we can share our risks because the scale is quite, quite, quite small, but also the benefits. And um, they, are, they, are, they are doing that themselves to a, to a, to a certain extent, but they also, they also call out to the, to the government because um, uh, they truly think, and I, I agree with them, that they are real transitional farmers and that they do serve a larger public good uh, not just, again, in terms of, of sustainability, but also in, in providing new economic solutions for farmers also in the future. And we have, I think, 50,000 farmers in the Netherlands alone. And if half of them is, uh, will, be, will be asked to, to look for other ways of using their land and their infrastructure, we do need best practices. And we also need a government that rewards the efforts of these protein farmers, for example. Um, there is one uh, thing about that because there's a lot of discussion, especially here in the Netherlands, on how to support these farmers, for example, or these cooperation corporations. And there are some there are some countries in Europe where there is a a fee uh, that farmers get for every acre. Uh, on which they produce, uh, for example, um, uh, protein-rich crops in, instead of using the, the land for other applications. Um, and in that sense, the, the Dutch government says, okay, we, we, we want to avoid a situation where farmers become um, structurally dependent on such subsidies. Um, and, I, and I recognize that. On the other hand, I also truly believe that these farmers should be rewarded for, for the transitional efforts that they are uh, that they are doing. So um, I've also proposed that it, it should not be an acre fee or support, but it's really a transition fee that should be rewarded to these farmers, creating the best practices and also being able to scale up and join forces. So um, in that, I see uh, uh, an important role of the government. And um, there's a 
another one and it is that's that's related to also making the 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 undesired or un, un, unsustainable choice less easy when it comes to for example the import of of proteins and that's also a very delicate issue uh, for, especially also when it comes to the relationship between Europe and and the US for example um in 1993, there was this uh, this agreement, the, um, the, the the Blair House Agreement, it's called, and that basically uh, opened the way for the import of protein-rich sources from the U.S. also to to Europe. Um, and in fact, now uh, it's it's it has made that, that that Europe is very dependent on the imports of soy also from the, from the U.S. or the Americas, and. Um, um, well, also there is a reality where it's it's huge volumes. About 30 million tons of soy is imported to Europe every year. Uh, a large part also coming from the Americas. Um, uh, whereas on the other hand, we we want to be more protein self-sufficient. Um, I do think that the that, that the Dutch, but also the European governments, can play a role in uh, also making new trade agreements in which protein self-sufficientness is also set as one of the goals and goals and that could imply that also the trade agreements could be made um, less in favor of importing uh, protein rich crops uh, from outside the eu to to inside the eu very interesting um it's i definitely see how the netherlands could play a larger role in this transition um, as in the Netherlands government, but it's really great to see how much you guys are already doing, especially compared to the US. And I think we definitely have a lot to learn from you guys. Okay, and then the, what, if, if, I, if I may ask a question back, uh, what, what is, do you think, Sophie, uh, and then also Hannah, a, 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 a limitation, a threshold at this moment for um, perhaps U.S. governments or uh, specific target groups to to really well uh, dive into or to invest in the all protein uh, team. Um, I don't think that there is a limitation. Um, I I do think that the main um, I guess the main barrier that's held us back so far has been the farmer lobbying groups, such as the Cattlemen's Association in the United States. I would say they've been the main ones um, holding back alt protein subsidization or alt protein research funding, um, unfortunately. But hopefully that'll change. Um, and I think that would definitely change if the government provided these cattlemen and farmers with a direct way to transition because most likely the only reason they are being um, aggressive towards the alt protein field with things such as veggie libel laws telling plant-based meat producers they can't label as meat or can't label as milk is because they feel threatened by alt protein. Yeah, I, I very much recognize that. And, and also this, this specific example that you give in terms of naming. And uh, um, it is still quite a challenge also here, but if we, if we start recognizing that it's all about partnership instead of polarization, where it's not about, in the case of the Netherlands, for example, that we are seen worldwide as a dairy nation or as a meat nation, but rather as a protein nation, which may still include also milk and dairy, but in a, in a broader uh, sense, also all protein solutions. That's, I think, a, a very crucial first step, especially, again, uh, where, where, where a serious business is becoming serious business. So we now have slaughterhouses in the Netherlands uh, that are converted not to slaughter uh, um, uh, cows, but to slaughter pulses. And to uh, to create uh, well alt protein solutions um, and uh, and also indeed farms that are also trans transformed in far from farming um, uh, cows also to farming uh, to farming pulses and also 
using the, as I call it, protein rich them. And I think that could be one of the, these denominators or the, these common denominators where we talked about earlier um, that can really also reach out to the, um, to the existing industry. Again, with, with, this, with this history and also the, um, the, also the commercial uh, benefits that are associated with that. So um, I, I hope, and I do have also think that also in, in America, there are, uh, there are some examples of companies that are, are seeing also that protein rich them and that, that are really transforming. I, I definitely agree. And I think a way it's been framed recently in some articles I've read is thinking about all, the alt protein movement as sort of the space race. And we need countries to somewhat be competing against each other to be the new leader in protein production, just like how countries competed against each other to get to the moon or are to get to Mars. Um, so I'm hoping that'll start happening. And you probably saw how um, the president of China talked about incorporating uh, cultivated meat research into their agricultural plan, which was really exciting to see. So True. hopefully True. the U.S. will get, get on the train and, you know, not not be left behind. Um, but could you please expand more on retrofitting the existing infrastructure and facilities that you guys do have in the Netherlands? Because I find that super interesting and something um, that I think could help out um, all protein startups a lot because of the manufacturing and infrastructure constraint they're currently facing to scale up. And um, I know that currently it's quite difficult for startups to be able to map out all of these different facilities to know exactly how to retrofit them. So I'd love to hear more about what you guys are doing to, to help companies with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also noted uh, a few years back that there, there were a growing number of, especially startups, as you say, uh, Sophia, that, that that were seeking facilities to scale up their 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 innovation. Um, and uh, there are three conditions uh, uh, that 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 are need that need to be to be met. Uh, that, um, um, uh, using that infrastructure, it should be affordable. Um, it also should deliver food grade products, so you can really taste them and, and, and also start selling them. And it should be scalable. And, um, and those three conditions are very hard to, to meet if you want to invest yourself in, uh, in infrastructure. I also noted that um, when diving a little bit more deep in that, the, that the, the types of processing infrastructure that these companies were seeking um, were very much available in the in the animal uh, protein scene. So when it comes to extracting proteins from milk, it's not so much different as extracting proteins from an algae extract or a or a, a for example or a um, a, a an, an oat extract. Uh, or when it comes to uh, shaping products, you can use similar infrastructure as the, that's used already to to produce burgers or bowls or sausages, for example, uh, or when it comes down to, uh, to drying uh, processes. So spray drying is, is, is a technology that's very commonly used to, to, to dry uh, dairy uh, extract to powder. And you can use that same infrastructure also to dry other protein-rich uh, aqueous uh, solutions. So what we have set up, it, we will, well, we, first we, we noted that and um, uh, and then we said, okay, let's. How can we um, stimulate uh, um, also uh, parties out there having that infrastructure uh, without even knowing that that their infrastructure could be uh, used also for other applications? So what we have created is a facility switch quick scan. So um, the uh, the facility quick uh, facility switch quick scan is all about and um, giving insights in if specific facilities can be switched in applications. So especially when now used somewhere in the animal protein uh, domain, um, if it can be used also for alternative protein solutions and thereby also delivering new, new business models also for, for the companies um, already exploiting those facilities. And um, that's worked out quite well uh, because next to the um, facilities that we have in the Netherlands, which will for sure also hold for, for your university in, when it comes down to 
lab work or research or really pilot level, um, we've now created also the situation that when companies want to scale up or do industrial production, that they can also, to a larger extent, use infrastructure that's that has been present there basically all the time, but that was not used yet for the applications in the all protein scope. So, um, so um, well, I've, I've given some examples already, but it also it also counts for for pack, for the packaging industry, um, and um, um, also there um, there's a well, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge opportunity to use existing infrastructure also to provide sustainable packaging solutions also for all protein innovations and products. Great, thank you so much, Jerome. Um, I think we only have time for one more question, unfortunately. Um, one theme you've talked about a lot over this session is being a game changer. So um, obviously there's a high demand for people with a combination of scientific skill and business-minded spirit, but what else is needed to be a game changer in the alt protein industry? And specifically, what, what steps can students take to become a game changer? Well, um, for, first of all, over, over the years, I've, I've gotten to know quite some uh, US game changers as well, like, like Ethan Brown or Josh Tetrick. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Um, but, but, and, and, and also some of them uh, clo closer by here in Europe. And um, it's an interesting question. If, I think if, if, if I were, were to, to, to point on one specific talent or characteristic, it is really to, to think beyond the, the reality as it is. So um, I've, I've heard so much in my time also as an entrepreneur that uh, it was not worth the while to step into plant meat, for example, because the market was so, so small and um, uh, who, who was who was needing who was really needing um, um, processed alternatives for beef or pork or chicken and uh, um, I, I, I said and also personally I believe truly believe that is that it could be of value so I said okay I, I don't take the the current reality for granted I, I I do see for myself but also for my children I foresee a new reality in which plant-based is again, again the, the, the new normal. Whereas, uh, and having said that, and, and thinking about that, Hannah, um, one key element is also that you are that you are able to to make it personal. So it's it, and with, with that I mean that that I myself also have a, a very personal drive to, well, to 20 years back say, okay, this this is going to be my uh, my contribution to a more sustainable world. I was quite sure that, um, that that my parents died at a very young age because they were over consuming also meat and dairy. And, um, and in, in that um, lies for me a personal drive. And I also see that with all the game changes that I've talked over the years, that they have this personal drive, which enables them to create some kind of energy that is well beyond the average for the average for for sure. So um, raising the bar, um, uh, thinking beyond the current re reality, also in terms of market size and uh, business models. I think that's uh, that's that's a few of the key elements. And I was I was in my 30s already when I uh, saw the, the light, so to say, and. Uh, and uh, entered the, the fascinating world of, of the protein shift also uh, as an entrepreneur. And uh, I'm quite jealous that, that, that you and also many of the uh, young people watching have the opportunity at a, at a younger age to, to, to really step into that, uh, that domain and, um, well, and, and work together also towards a more sustainable protein future. Great, thank you so much for that insight. Um, we really appreciate you participating in the Clean Tech Summit and thank you so much for your presentation and um, helping us all learn about the Netherlands. Yeah, thank you.
think he's your own. And thank you for all the work you've done in the alt protein field for the past 15 or so years and being one of the first people really getting the field going back in 2009. So forever grateful yeah. for that. Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you, Hannah. And also thank you for your pioneering work that you're doing uh, back there. And uh, I hope we will we'll stay in touch also after the summit. Uh, the best sure. of, uh, of, of luck and enjoy your, your summit.